For decades, there have been two families in cannabis. The outdoor growers who use the sunshine and indoor growers who used lights. They each developed their own approaches. Both dabbled in synthetic nutrients, but indoor growers really approached synthetic and processed nutrients as an art form. Outdoor folks generally were using less processed inputs, but certainly not always, and both groups tended to use chemical pesticides when needed. Over the last 20 years, as people became more aware of eating organic food, health-conscious cannabis farmers, both indoors and outdoors, began reducing their synthetic inputs and using more raw natural materials. Very generally, though, it was the outdoor folks who were leading in that direction, and indoor growers were still focused on bottled nutrients, especially hydroponic folks. All of that has been turned upside down as more cultivators in every part of the industry began to use more natural inputs. And then, with state taxation of cannabis, came regulations that nearly demanded the exclusion of many of the traditional chemicals growers would use. As a person who's dedicated to living soil, you can imagine my curiosity and glee when I came across images on Instagram of grow operations in just about every legal state beginning to bring living soil techniques indoors. The lushness of the polyculture and companion planting, but done indoors in raised beds or on tables. I started talking to other folks like me about these amazing photos I was seeing, and they were all jazzed about these new possibilities too. A bright future of climate-controlled indoor growing, but with real living soil and worms instead of mechanized hydroponics. If you want to learn about cannabis health, business, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you new podcast episodes as they come out delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, we're giving away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. There's nothing else you need to do to win except receive the newsletter. So go to shapingfire.com and sign up for the newsletter and be entered into this month's and all future newsletter prize drawings. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. My guest today is Joshua Steensland. Joshua Steensland is a lifelong cannabis cultivator and educator. He is presently lead cultivator at Freshwater Farms in Oregon. He also has a very active YouTube channel where he teaches cannabis horticulture. Formerly, he was a hydroponic store owner with a heavy emphasis on customer education and has himself evolved from using synthetics to using organic bottled nutrients and is now dedicated to living soil, no-till, and raw amendments. Today, we're going to talk about all of those things. Welcome to the show, Joshua. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, so glad to have you on. So let's start by giving a little context to folks about where you come from, kind of, I don't know, philosophically. So how did you find your way to indoor polyculture? Like, were you an indoor guy who wanted to be more natural, or were you an outdoor guy who then brought your outdoor skills indoors for work? Yeah, I, I'm actually always been an indoor cultivator. And uh, I just, I never had the space to do it outdoors and always just kind of was really intrigued with the idea of being, having a controlled environment and being able to uh, control all those different ver atmospheric variables. Uh, and, and eventually just kind of gravitated towards wanting to do things in a more natural fashion and and that, that's how I ended up where I'm at. It's really interesting because, you know, for so long, um, you know, a lot of the indoor folks were all like, listen, you just can't use these outdoor techniques indoors. They just don't make the transition. And for a long time, people kind of, you know, some people believe that. And now suddenly in the last few years, people like you are actually doing it. So when you first started, you know, implementing this stuff and, you know, telling your buddies about it, did you get some disbelief and pushback and you had to push, you know, uh, um, you know, prove them wrong? Or were people like, hell yeah, man, go that direction? Uh, there was a fair amount of uh, healthy skepticism. And, uh, and as I just kept progressing and kept, kept pushing forward, <clears throat> people were seeing the results I was getting. And uh, they're, they're kind of speak for themselves. 
Yeah, they sure do. I mean, that's that's what started all of this with me reaching out to you is I just started following you on Instagram and the the the, the images of your polycultured tables at Freshwater were just like astonishing. It was you know, just like looking them and, and making the picture big, you know, and so that you can look really closely and going, oh my God, he's actually doing this. So <laughs> that was all really exciting. So, so, you know, aside from the cannabis, uh, chemo bars that you're choosing, how did you go about choosing your companion plants? Because you've got a lot of options to choose from. How did you think through that, that, that challenge? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, the there's a lot of really good information and there's a lot of great companies like build a soil that put together cover crop blends that are kind of pre-made for living soils, uh, that have lots of clover and, uh, you know, nitrogen fixing companion plants, uh, with that avail, that kind of information available, readily available, it was really easy to kind of just dive in and start learning what was happening below the surface, you know, not with just the cannabis roots, but with the roots of the other plants and, and even like the foliage with the dynamic accumulators like comfrey and whatnot that, uh, uh, I just really just dove in and started looking into what all those, what all the benefits are. And everything that I kept coming up with was, um, diversity is key. You know, you really, you really want a diverse, uh, population of companion plants to, uh, because they all do something different. They all have their their little part to play in this symphony. And um, it just seems to me that the more parts, the more things that are allowed to play their part, the sweeter the music. Oh, right on. That's nicely put. So so how many notes do you use? You know, this may be, <laughs> this may be a, a question that you don't <clears throat> actually know, but do you know how many other species of companion plants you've got outside of the cannabis? Oh my goodness. It's it's pretty considerable. I started with the 12 seed cover crop, crop blend from Build a Soil and then um fr- which is you know like 60% clovers, different clovers and and vetch and whatnot. And then I started adding other things like daikon radish, uh beets, broccoli we have and and I've at- recently learned that broccoli might actually not be good because of a potential fungal inhibiting um, component of its of it, so I have to some research to do on that. But uh, so we're always learning, you know. We're all I'm, I'm forever educating myself, and um, if I learn that something's not good for the bed, like if I learn that broccoli is not good, I'm taking it out for sure. Uh, but I've got so many, so many things in there. I'm really just not afraid to throw anything in there. So 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 all right. So the broccoli may not make it uh, or may right. not stay. But right. uh, have you already <laughs> experimented with any other plants that you decided don't work for you? Uh, to be honest with you, no. Right. Uh, you know, a, a, everything tends to the things that some things just don't come back from the flowering period because the canopy gets so dense. There's a, a relatively large die-off that happens underneath. So during the vegetative stage. Um, when there's lots of light penetrating, the cover crop flourishes and, and the, your companion plants flourish. And then the canopy kind of overtakes things and you get a lot less light down there to the soil surface. And then there's this die off. Um, and sometimes things just don't come back. Like I've had come free die off and not come back. Um, and I don't really fuss or worry about it. I just figure if it, the conditions weren't right for that particular one to come back, then I, I'm not really worried. That's um, re- that's really interesting. I've never really considered how the the dense canopy of a cannabis plant would block out the light from the unders, and suddenly it's like you know, like when you visit the 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 giant redwoods, right? It's mostly right. just ferns and and you know, duff on the ground at that point. And so a lot of the plants that when the plants are, when the cannabis plants are young, they're getting full light, suddenly they're going to get choked out. It's, have you ever, uh, like replanted or added, uh, low light plants? Like when you start bloom? Um, no, that, that's a, that's an interesting consideration. I really have, I haven't though. I, I do reseed occasionally, like if we get a significant die off and for one reason or another, sometimes the, the large leaves, like say, especially of comfrey, um, they'll die off and they'll completely choke out any light from the soil surface. So you end up, once the comfrey leaves have been kind of consumed by the soil, um, 
uh, biology, you're left with a bare spot. And um, so uh, occasionally I'll have to reseed those bare spots. And uh, But uh, uh, making specific uh, light, low light plant considerations, I just haven't done that. I, I really kind of appreciate the nutrient cycling faction, factor that happens when the cover crop flourishes. It's got all this nutrient capacity in its leaves and then the flowering period starts and then so it dies off and creates like a mulchy layer over the soil so it's just building to the humus layer it's contributing to a nutrient cycling and more importantly it it just allows me to spend less time in the garden and, and just allow that kind of little micro ecosystem to do its thing so I certainly get the value of when you get the die off um, that 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 nutrient nutrient cycling is natural and good. I've got I've got two, I guess, really specific <clears throat> questions about that. So the first one would be, um, you know, if if having the cover crop if one of the benefits of it uh, is that it creates this like mini rainforest down near the bottom. So it holds in moisture and, and, and water vapor down towards the, the top of the soil so that your microbes can live closer to the top of the soil. Does it, do you, do you worry at all that if you've got these patches that you're losing that advantage or over the, over the size of an entire, uh, uh, bed, it doesn't really matter that much. I, th- I think it, when you take the whole bed into consideration, it's it's not as big of a factor. And that, that's the benefit, I think, of having a, a larger soil volume. Um, I've, I've often used the uh, analogy of aquarium keeping or fish tanks and that I used to keep little nano reef tanks and 55-gallon tanks. And, and for obvious reasons, the smaller the tank, the harder it is to keep things in equilibrium, you know, um, and the larger the volume of water in a tank, uh, it's a lot easier to keep it pH stable and, and everything. So it's really similar in soil beds. If you've got a larger four by eight, you got 1.2 or 1.3 yards in, in of soil in your bed, little pockets of, okay, say, anaerobic uh, bacterial activity or, you know, little pockets of areas that are running less than optimally aren't aren't such a big deal right on i'm gonna take a little sidebar here um you mentioned aquariums and 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 i too have got a a background in aquariums and actually after my brain injury uh one of the only things i could do was raise uh specialty aquarium shrimp Mm. and sell those to other aquarium people and you know not only do like you know stoner folk just like looking at fish right but other than that i i find that uh people who are into aquariums and building that kind of natural and yet artificial environment also take quickly to growing cannabis because they are similar similar ideas where it's like okay i want to make this as natural as possible but i want to do it in this artificial environment and encapsulate nature you know inside my home uh, was that kind of an experience for you too a- absolutely I- i've said i've had similar conversations with people about this very topic that and at the time, at, at one point in time, I was really big into hydroponics and recirculating deep water culture, um, and and I very often just kept feeling like it was back in my aquarium days because we're really in both of those instances, you're just water keepers, you know, you're water tenders, <laughs> and it's your and it's your job to keep the water, you know, the water conditions perfect, and so there's a there's that obvious correlation there, um, and I think you you kind of touched on it too that there's this kind of desire to recreate something natural and and do it you know in the most pristine way possible and there's just there's kind of this intrinsic reward there i like your idea of aquarium being we're we're water keepers it reminds me it reminds me of uh the famous natural farming guy joel saladin who always said listen i don't i don't farm foods and chickens and cattle he's like i'm a grass farmer and so long (laughs) as the grass is healthy and, and pesticide and chemical free all the animals that live upon it will do well and i always thought that that you know, related really well to regenerative cannabis growing as well, where a lot of what we're doing is, is we're soil farmers, we're microbe farmers. And as as long as that soil is uh, bountiful, it will offer the buffet of all the nutrients that our cannabis plants need. And then they just do it on their own. 
Without question, it's it's a it's a wonderful, beautiful miracle that we've been you know that we've been given, and uh, I'm really uh, proud and impressed to see the speed at which people are starting to kind of reclaim this old you know this old ways you know there's like this revival of the old ways people are sick of um you know being lied to and being poisoned and 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 you realize that there's just a simpler way and if you just take care of the soil it takes care of you so circling back to when we were talking about uh, some of the spots of the uh, the cover crop dying out, um, do you ever find that that is helpful, like a canary in a coal mine, where if something's going on with your cover crop, maybe it's it's like letting you know of a problem early that you might experience with the cannabis plants themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think if you allowed yourself to uh, kind of hyper-analyze things, you could definitely... Uh, kind of postulate what's going on. I tend to, I am really tend to be very, very, very hands-off. I'm very Fukuoka-esque in I like to just observe. You know, once once the plants are in, once things are, are going, you, it's really just our job to observe and kind of do gentle steering and guiding. And and um, that's what really works for me. I, I, my days of being kind of the mad scientist in the grow room and spending hours in there, uh, you know, fussing over pH levels and all these other things, those are over. Those are long gone. I, I, so to get to your uh, question, is when I see bare spots on there, it, it's usually always been because of a thick patch from the die-off. And if it and when I re-veg, if it doesn't get kind of repopulated by the, uh, the, re, the bloom of regrowth, then I'll, you know, the next cycle I'll reseed it and I really don't uh, worry or concern myself too much because, uh, you know, it's a it's a really simple process, and if you if as long as you follow a few a few simple rules, it's really hard to go wrong. Right on. So <clears throat> this next question, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest uh, three categories of polycultural planting, and sure. and you are clearly more advanced than I am on this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest this theory, and then I just want to hear your your thoughts on it, uh, you know, even even if you vehemently disagree. So sure, uh, sure. So I find that uh, so far in my learning about polyculture planting, they seem to fall into three categories. Like first is companion planting of plants that seem to encourage cannabis plant growth, and then there seems to be uh, interplanting, which is just simply green filler to cover soil so that the moisture is higher up in the soil towards the surface and they gen you know they participate in, in a generally healthy rhizosphere and then and then there's um i guess there's four categories ipm planting of plants that it has something to do with keeping pests away and then some people add a fourth category which is as food right so if you're going to go through all this this effort you might as well get some you know you know some cherry tomatoes to eat while you're there or or to the extreme example you know nick and liz over at uh, green source gardens where mm -hmm. where they're getting huge amounts of food out of their outdoor gardens so so with this in mind you know how do you think about the different categories of polyculture plants when you are strategizing uh, that's a really good question, and I, I've just got to give huge uh, shout out to Green Source Gardens. Those guys are just the shining example of uh, regenerative homesteading, and I just, you know, what they have is something we should all be striving for. You know, it's just they've got a really beautiful thing, and I can't say enough uh, uh, good things about what what they do. I, I, um, I second that. The tour I got there this summer floored me. It's like this is the gold standard for what we're all trying to do. Yeah, without question, yeah. without question, they are the shining example, the tip of the spear, and uh, they they deserve all the accolades that that come with that. Um, as far as the polyculture, you know, I, I, all the categories that you mentioned, I think we should when when participating in this cultivation style, you, we should try to achieve all of those things in, in the beds. You know, I think. Uh, um, at first, my first concern was maybe just kind of nutrient cycling and moisture retention. So there was a time when I just used uh, rye grass one time. I, I just planted a bunch of rye grass just, just specifically to kind of eliminate 
a, a lot of the um, composting material that I had because I had a problem with the wood louse and roly polies. And so uh, I was trying to eliminate their food source, you know, just kind of uh, messing around with things. And I didn't, I didn't really like how the, how it felt. And then what, what I got in the end, when the die off happened, I ended up with just this huge mat of ryegrass and it just didn't really work for me. Um, and, and I've really learned that the, once again, the greater, uh, diversity I had, the healthier things seemed to be. Um, and that's when I started to include the food crops that I don't really harvest. I just leave in to rot, like the beets and the daikon, um, parsnips and those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think they're just, they're just wildly uh, valuable to the, the soil. That's interesting that you leave them in because I can see the advantages from that, of course, as well. I mean, I like the idea of, of growing the food and being able to extract extra value out of the garden and also, you know, the, the novelty, right? Oh, hey, look what I grew next to my cannabis plants indoors, right? That's kind of cool. But the idea of letting it go through uh, its life cycle and then rotting there in the soil, of course, that's going to create the opportunity for so many micronutrients that you wouldn't normally have. So hmm, I'm gonna, I'm, now I want to play with that. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I think of it as just uh, varying the, the kind of the nutrient uh, volumes in the earthworm castings, the, the natural earthworm castings that we get. You know, if we uh, give them various food sources, you know, then the, the quality of the castings that we get fresh from the source in the beds is going to be better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, you know, when we design our, our arc of light, if we will, um, for the cannabis plants, um, and you know, I think, I think you do 18, six, a lot of folks do 18, six, and then we, we switch to 12, 12 for the bloom, but that's not really, uh, true for a lot of the plants that we are putting into our polyculture and, I'm curious what your experience has been finding these other plants, th these multitude of plants that you're putting alongside the cannabis. How do they react to 18.6 and then 12.12 and specifically when you flip? Because I would think that while we do that to kind of startle the cannabis plants to suddenly bloom, that may well freak out a lot of the companion plants. But I've never grown it at the level as you have to like, you know, have a good uh, set of data. No, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, I, what I've observed over time is the, like, for instance, the broccoli never flowers. Uh, it just, for whatever reason, and I don't know enough about how broccoli works necessarily, that it, it just is all, it just stays in this perpetual vegetative state. Um, and so that's the one, one thing that I've noticed different. It, it's hard to tell what difference is what the differences are attributed to when we flip flip to flower because the canopy is so dense by that time that changes have kind of already started to happen mm -hmm. at the lower levels before we even flipped it to, to 12 and 12 um, because of the reduced light. So it's really difficult to say, you know, there, there's a pretty drastic and pronounced die off, you know, late in veg once the canopy is thick enough you know, to initiate flower at that point in time, they, they, they've been under reduced light for several weeks. And uh, it, it's really hard to say what, what light is doing at that point. Yeah, you've got a lot of variables at that point yeah, and no control absolutely. group. Yeah, that makes yep, sense. Absolutely. So <clears throat> as far as like uh, water usage goes, um, mm. you know, I find that generally the way that I've done it in the past, kind of pre-polyculture, since this is new to me as well. But I have found that indoor generally needs to be watered more than outdoor. But when you companion plant this much, um, you know, you're retaining a lot of water and the plants create that moist rainforest effect at soil level. So how does uh, planting polyculture impact the water requirements? Uh, it, it's, it's incredible how little water is needed uh, for a uh, for a four by eight bed when it's when it's properly cultivated uh, the 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 companion plants do such a good job or even if you just used a straw mulch and you weren't even companion planting um the <clears throat> anything covering the soil is going to help um, retain that moisture and help prevent you know the transpiration of it and and uh 
yeah, so I, I get by like in my home grow, <clears throat> I got three four by eight beds, and they're fed by a like a seven gallon reservoir to blue mat drippers. And if I had to turn the water off, that seven gallons would last me four or five days, mm. um, maybe even a, a, a week. Uh, so it, the water requirements are so nil, and it, I think it's just insanely valuable, especially as we, you know, when we start thinking about conservation. Yeah, that that polyculture plus blue mat really is a nice system. Game changer. Yeah, yeah. totally. So hey, uh, we'll take our first short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is uh, Joshua Steensland, lead cultivator at Freshwater Farms. Living soil and regenerative cannabis agriculture are surging in popularity, and to implement these biological solutions, real science education is vital. If you are interested in all things probiotic growing, you will probably want to attend the upcoming Science of Organic Regenerative Cannabis Cultivation Conference. Joshua Rutherford of Dutch Blooms has lined up an incredible array of educators for the traveling event. The teaching staff includes Leighton Morrison and Elaine Ingham on soil biology, Chris Trump talking Korean natural farming, Kevin Jodry on cannabis genetics, Kelly and Josh from Dragonfly Earth Medicine, Suzanne Wainwright, the bug lady, Dr. Robert Faust on natural biostimulants, Stephen Raisner on aquaponics, and Chip Osborne on soil testing, and even more folks will be there. There will be a grower panel, a breeding panel, and a DEM certified farmers panel. Joshua has even built in significant informal time for you with the teachers as well. The teaching staff is just as excited to work with you as you are about attending. And there's no advertising at the event, no vendor booths. Your tuition is what is paying the staff, so they will all be very present and attentive to you, not a corporate sponsor. Even better, the conference is not just for folks on the West Coast. Humboldt, California is hosting one event for sure, but the show is going on the road to Vancouver, British Columbia, Portland, Maine, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Get out your pen now because I'm about to give you the website. This is a fabulous opportunity for you to hear from an array of nationally recognized top shelf soil educators all in one place. Not only that, this isn't just beginner stuff like you get at most conventions. This is an intensive for people like us who totally nerd out on the rhizosphere. The website is regenerativeorganiccannabis.com. That's regenerativeorganiccannabis.com. You can also find a link on the Shaping Fire Instagram and newsletter. Cut through all the misinformation out there and don't miss this opportunity to learn real soil science. As a listener of Shaping Fire, you already understand the importance of living soil when growing cannabis. When you have active microbe communities in your substrate, you go way beyond simply fertilizing with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Having active microorganisms in your substrate supports vigorous plant growth throughout the plant's root zone, making for higher yields and thriving flowers. Mammoth pea is the first organically derived microbial inoculant that focuses on your plant's nutrient cycling processes to release soil phosphorus and other micronutrients from their bound forms, making them more available to the plant. Increased levels of phosphorus will also keep inner nodes shorter and focus your plant's energy on bud production. Not only that, but the microbes act as a defense shield for the plant's rhizosphere by outcompeting potentially harmful pathogenic microbes. Pretty cool, right? Mammoth pea not only unlocks the nutrients in your soil, but it also helps protect your plant from disease. Mammoth pea's beneficial bacteria act like microbioreactors, continually producing enzymes that release nutrients. Mammoth pea was developed at a U.S. university and has been extensively tested by Colorado growers and independent laboratories. Mammoth pea is proven to increase growth and enhance blooming. One of the great things about supplementing with microorganisms is that they won't compete with whatever fertilizer program you're already running. Simply dose on top of your fertilizer schedule for increased benefits. To learn more and to find out where you can buy Mammoth Pea near you, check out their website at www.mammothmicrobes.com. Partner with microorganisms to create beautiful, thriving cannabis. Mammoth P. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Lose. And our guest this week is Joshua Steensland, lead cultivator at Freshwater Farms. So before the break, we were talking about uh, the variety of polyculture plants and the positive impacts that they um, offer um, in your indoor grow. 
I'm really curious, when you are choosing your plants for integrated pest management, did you choose for all potential pests that could happen? Or did you choose plants that would be helpful for the ones that you usually have to deal with locally in your bioregion? Oh, that's a good question. I, I didn't give it a heck of a lot of consideration uh, aside from just just basic knowledge like a, I mint I use mint and marigold um, at, at times uh, mint has been my main kind of IPM uh, companion plant but but mainly I, I, I tend to use companion plants less for IPM and more for uh, pests kind of like the canary in the coal mine for pest ID uh, um, I've learned that clover flower, when it's allowed to flower, really, uh, uh, the thrips really like clover flowers. So, um, it, once you have flowering clover, if you, if they're going to, thrips are going to attack that clover first. Um, spider mites seem to really like clover over cannabis as well. So, I mean, these are the, those are, that's kind of the low hanging fruit. So to me, the companion plant is really more of an observational tool to, to kind of help me see where we have a potential hot spot. And and then and also just knowing things that like clover flower attracts thrips, you can take some preventative measure, preventative IPM measures by adding the proper uh, beneficials, say before your clover is flowering, to to tackle the potential influx of thrips. I like that idea of the plant as the canary in coal mine because you know I had not really considered that perspective in for for when planting companion plants to for IPM normally it's either okay I'm going to add this plant because it gives off terpenes that wards off pests right so that's one kind and then and then just simple trap plants which is kind of what you're talking about about the clover flowers because it will attract the thrips to your clover flower instead of to your cannabis but but this idea this additional idea that oh um it's a ther- you know the, these these trap plants are actually a thermometer letting me know how how much my my pest infest, infestation is because you know as as all of us living soil folks know it's not about having zero thrips it's about keeping the thrips you have in balance and never letting them you know overrun the grow and um, I think that's a really novel idea yeah it's 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 one of those things that you know clover. Spider mites pre- like the clover. It doesn't mean they're not going to uh, make their way onto your cannabis, but they certainly hit the clover first, and same definitely with the thrips. And it, it's just one of those deals where, like I said, the low hanging fruit. And if, if you're observing that, that's usually where you're going to start to get um, your first signs and indications. And it's been an insanely uh, invaluable tool over the years. While we're talking about pests, let's uh, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, the use of. Um, of essential oils. So a lot of folks, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's an ongoing debate, right? People say that if you foliar feed certain essential oils, that uh, the, the pests don't like it. And so they'll avoid your cannabis plants. And certainly we're talking about, you know, veg or only in the first, you know, maybe week of, of flower, not talking about late in flower, but, but then other folks, right? The other folks will say, nah, 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 you don't want to spray essential oils on your plants because the oils plug stomata and make it more difficult for the plants to breathe. And, and I've watched enough of the videos on your fabulous YouTube channel to know that you've got a, a pretty strong understanding of, of cannabis botany itself. So, so what were your thoughts be on on this ongoing debate um well i think i think context is important here i mean if uh if if we're talking about just you know you're like if we're talking about like say a method one pps which is essential oils and i think a little bit of alcohol um you know i'm i have no problem with those I, i i think that there is a potential for say neem oils or some really heavily applied essential oils to clog the stomata, especially if you're using them in in succession, like you just one essential oil spray after another. Uh, yeah, I think there's a potential for buildup and 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 possible uh, stomata blockage. But I think that if your if your IPM practices were such that you're um, 
hitting it with an essential oil on day one. And so maybe day three, doing like an aloe rinse on your leaves or whatever as a foliar. Like those, if, you, if you're practicing your IPM in that fashion, I think that's drastically going to reduce the possibility of that happening. Um, I, I think that if you went with kind of a commercially produced oil product, those tend to be really light in the oils. Um, it's going to be your DIY guys um, that might go a little heavy with the oils and whatnot, or, and they could run into potential issues. But I think, I think adding a rinse is, is, is important. Yeah, I have been that place myself when I was more of a rookie than I am now, where it's like, well, if it says this much is good, if I add three times that amount, it's going to be triple strength, you know? And, right. and, and in the end, it doesn't really work. And, and like most of these ideas that we're talking about, um, it's about balance, right? So, and, or moderation is what I meant to say. Moderation. So, so yeah, if you're going to use these foliars, um, <clears throat> use them in moderation. Don't plan on leaning on them to do, to do all the lifting. Definitely. Definitely. Less is more. Um, I, 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 it's easier to add than subtract in situations like this. If you've overdone it, it's especially with foliar feeding or with, with IPM or even like if, if you're, feeding some kind of bottled nutrient regime it's it's always e- you always want to start with less because it's easier to add the things that maybe you didn't get in the first time than it is to kind of take it back once you've applied it to the plant yeah it's way hard to take it back <laughs> <laughs> yeah, impossible um so you know pretty much everybody has been in the situation where they're they're late into bloom and you get a pest infestation at you know the worst possible time. And and granted, you know if if you've got a clean room, if you've got you know uh, IPM plants planted, if you are are doing foliars in 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 vegetative state, if you are uh, you know if you're doing all of this stuff, your likelihood should be very low. However, you know sometimes bad things happen to good people. So so. If you were to get an infestation, let's just pick spider mites, but you can give, you know, whatever example you most appropriate to you. But something like that in week, say, four, uh, mm-hmm. where you're not going to be doing a lot of these sprays because it'll mess with the taste of the flowers and then could potentially risk molds then because the, the flowers will be getting wet. What are your go to solutions w- at that point where everything is so limited, our options? Yeah, I mean, I think if. Nobody wants to be in that position, and, and it, at some, you have to kind of just gauge how how severe your infestation is. And, and the the beautiful thing about about this situation is, is that if you've had had good practices, like you were saying, up to, to up to four weeks, and you just got kind of an incidental exposure, that that could be pretty easily fixed with a heavy dose of beneficial. Uh, predators, you know, that that's pretty much your only go to in this in this instance. And you know, if, if you're at week four, and you have a severe infestation with webbing and whatnot, you messed up somewhere. Along <laughs> the way. So so there's some serious user error. So if at, if at week four, you've got just kind of a light little hot spot in your grow, you know, things to consider are hitting it with a very heavy dose of like, you know, facilis or them really like uh, very hungry um, predators or just kind of rooting that spot out and cutting it out and cutting your losses. So if it's one or two plants in the back of your greenhouse or one or two plants in one of your beds, uh, it, it might be worth it to just kind of cut your losses, get rid of the ones that, that could be problematic. Um, but I tend to want to um, throw uh, live stuff at it and and try my luck with that. I'm glad you mentioned the beneficials because I, I've become a big fan of beneficials. And this year was the first year uh, that I used them heavily from veg all the way through the end with uh, sure. three different applications. And it was it was delightful. I didn't have any pest issues this year, which was like astonishing and fantastic. So did you find that your companion plants, uh, especially the trap plants, were also attracting your beneficials or were you able to choose trap plants that were more interested, um, uh, that the pests were more interested in them than any of the beneficials you were using? Well, that's a good question. I I think that uh, anytime that I've had that experience where I've seen it on the clover, we took really uh, uh, 
quick and decisive action. So we didn't really don't give it much time to to observe whether it liked the cannabis more or whether the predators had more of an effect. The first the first sign of any kind of uh, nonsense, we just throw an obscene amount of bugs at it, and and um, and that you, that's every time has done the trick. You know, I I really think that. I would love to be able to do a no spray IPM on the commercial scale, and I think it's doable. I, I think that uh, no spray IPM is is really like the, the most ideal way to go about. That way, you can just focus on your foliar feeding, and and know that your pests are are handled by the predators. But unfortunately, a lot of times, like in our situation at Freshwater Farms, we are in uh, or we're surrounded by hemp fields, and we're also surrounded by other cultivated cultivation facilities and so it it became really apparent to us in our first cycle that we were not going to be able to get away with a no spray ipm um that because the influx of bad guys was just um more than we we could throw bugs at that's an interesting idea the idea that you know if if, if you were by yourself over there that you would not attract nearly as many from all the dirty ass farms around you <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, and I and I've got no, you know, no no problem with anybody else. I think that there's just kind of a natural thing that happens too. You know, you get that many cannabis plants in one area, they just send a signal out. You know, like like the bugs just know, like oh, in that building there's a bunch. You know, or there's a huge hemp field. So everywhere in the area, they're just kind of migrating that way, and they just find their way into the facilities. So during the first set, we were talking about water and how um, between all of the companion plants and the blue mats that your water requirements are actually really low. I wondered what your thoughts were about nutrients, because for folks new to companion planting, it's a pretty common pushback for them to say, well, you know, my nutrients are really expensive and I don't want them to be all taken up by the companion plants. Sure. And, and, and I get that. Um, I usually start with, hmm, what? nutrients are you're buying that are so expensive right but <laughs> but to their point i was curious if you find that um to what degree the companion plants swipe nutrients from the cannabis plants and so how does that impact your feeding sure that, that's a that's a good consideration to have i mean i i had the same thoughts when i was first getting into this and i think i think we as a whole, don't really understand the vastness of what's available in the soil and, uh, and, and in a properly amended soil. So like in my situation, we don't – I know that Tad with Keep It Simple, uh, he always recommends that we re-amend every cycle, and, and I really value his opinion, but I, I, I really hold fast to my minimalist approach, and we do it every other cycle. And um, – and we're still finding that even though we're waiting, you know, six months, it's really, we're basically re our beds twice a year, uh, that there's plenty to go around in that six months. And uh, you just kind of have faith. You kind of have faith in the, in the process and the system and know that those, those plants, they are, they're, they are uptaking some minerals and some nutrients, but they're also going to give it back in that cycling uh, process. You know, and even if you were cutting down – your cover crop and then fermenting it and applying it back to your soil as a tea, you know, you can, you can capture all, you can capture a percentage of those nutrients that the plants took and give it back or just allow the plant to give it back when it, when you go through your die off process. So going further down that line of thought, you know, when, when, when people ask me about uh, the, the nutrients that the companion plants take up and, and it's taking away from my cannabis plant. What I normally tell them is if, if you are going to go to the point of having companion plants and to be feeding a, uh, the, the whole bed a natural diet, um, whatever you are out financially for the nutrients that the companion plants are going to uptake, you will end up receiving far, far more from the additional 
uh, micronutrients and uh, nutrients that are germane to the soil that will be created because you've got all these additional plants and 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 the mycelium that comes with it and they are you know all the additional microbes so so you may be putting in some nutrients and those plants may be taking them up but the symphony like you were talking about will actually cause far more nutrients than you paid to put in the bags absolutely it's over unity it's an investment yeah. It, you know, it's just like in the old days when I used to own a brick and mortar hydroponic shop in Southern Oregon, and you know the the thing we would always say is, you know, you sh- if you're in here spending a thousand dollars, you shouldn't feel terrible because that thousand dollars is going to earn you ten thousand. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it's kind of a similar thought process. You know, what you've got to sacrifice a little, but in the bigger picture. You know, you, you get more in the end. So that's really, really well put. I like that. So along that same vein, my favorite part of polyculture is the interplay of the roots of the different plants, right? Mm. And and you know, my science knowledge is is growing, but I would still call it somewhat limited. Uh, so, so as, at a certain, it's like when when you know people say any uh, justifiably evolved technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right. Um, you know, t- t- for me, soil science still. I since I consider myself still a novice. At a certain point, I get a, down a level of a detail, and then it's just magic, right? So, right. so one of my favorite parts is the interplay of roots and mycelium. And the soil, um, uh, through the soil and the and rhizosphere speaking, you know these these networks where they're they're moving around nutrients and they're and they're sending signals about pests mm-hmm. that are on the other side of the bed, yeah. and um, for some because of some reason this this symphony as you put it, it really seems to increase the thriving nature of the entirety of the bed even though this is mostly invisible to us. So over time, you know, I know that you spend a lot of time with your beds and you've got, you know, at this point, decades of experience. So as the cultivator, over time, can you sense any of that activity below the soil since you're with them for such long periods of time? Yeah, I mean, without sounding too, you know, starry-eyed, there's definitely... um, there's something that happens when you've like when you feel like you've achieved homeostasis when everything is just firing on all cinder, cylinders you, your plants and your your there's this kind of iridescence that happens with your plants the lipid layers on your cannabis are thick and beautiful and and it's when you show people pictures they're just like oh my gosh supreme health like it's that feeling you get when you look at a plant that's just you you can tell that it's had its maximum genetic potential is expressed. You know, it, it, there's just a feeling that that happens, and and I think that's what calls a lot of us to this living soil process. It allowed a lot of us to kind of put our ego aside because it's really hard, really, to take credit for the cannabis that I've that I grow in these systems because I literally don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I literally plant them in and observe. I mean, I, I mean I, I'll lollipop, I'll thin a little bit, but I'm not in there fussing over things, and I'm not, and I'm just observing, and that, and that's, that's when having the trust in the in the process and having faith in that magic that happens. Because I'm no, I'm no soil scientist. I'm a high school graduate, and I went to, I went to school for, I went to a trade school for audio engineering. So you know, I'm Pro Tool certified. I, I've, I have no idea about the soil science, right? I just know what has worked. And from what my, you know, uh, very basic understanding, and I think, you know, your actual soil scientists themselves, like Dr. Elaine Ingham and, and Lowenfels, they'll be the first ones to tell you that we're, we're only at, they are only at a 10% knowledge of what's happening. So there's still a lot of magic that needs to be deciphered there. So <clears throat> even though that you say that you, you don't mess with it much, and then earlier on you said that, that you're kind of past your days of bothering about pH because of how you grow, <laughs> your pH is going to be correct and stable. I'm curious uh, where you fall. I mean, how regularly do you test your soil? Um, th- this is uh, something that I wanted to tighten up on my regime. Uh, at my home grow, I've never tested my soil. So my soil has been in – I know Tad has been really wanting me to get soil samples in just – just to kind of get the data um, because I've been, I'm over three years on these beds and I just have kind of like, if the plants look like they're doing good, I'm not fussing about it. 
But now that we're on this commercial level with fresh water, we're going to start to implement, you know, at least twice a year soil samples and soil analysis so we can kind of see what's being consumed, what's being left behind, and then maybe move forward with kind of a more conscientious amending as opposed to just kind of throwing a basic amending kit that's kind of got a little bit of everything um, you know, I, 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 soil analysis, I think, is crucial for data and crucial for uh, uh, moving forward and keeping costs down and those kind of things. Because now that we're not black market or medical, you know, we're really concerned with cost of goods produced and all these type of things. So um, analysis and data is is crucial. Taking another step down this this science path, you know, when when in medical days in each state before the heavy regulation and taxing comes along we all had a lot more flexibility in our grow locations and so uh places that i have worked and places that i have visited very often uh we i would see um two stations there would be a dab station and then there would be a science station and mm -hmm. and, and 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 you know they'd have a rig on one side and then they have a microscope on the other <laughs> side so I, I was curious you know clearly you know you can't have the dab station anymore under under the new regulations but but perhaps you um are the kind of guy who keeps a um a microscope station in case you know maybe maybe to check out your bugs or whatever thing. So I was just curious if you if you keep a microscope in the grow. We I have a, a like your little USB four hundred times scope that you see lots of folks have, mm -hmm. and I think that sometime in the next uh, six months to a year, uh, I'm definitely going to be interested in taking some actual courses on microscopy because. Uh, uh, Elaine Ingham has some really good courses and I'd like to get into that because I think that that's kind of that's the next level is being able that's why one of the reasons why I don't like doing aerated compost teas uh, because I just don't you don't know what you're getting really until you can get in there and look at what you're actually cultivating in that tea and so I've been hesitant to go down that route simply because my skill set just kind of didn't didn't allow for me to know exactly what was happening in the soil. I think it's a, a very, very valuable skill to have, and it, it's something that I'm definitely going to be putting into my um, future uh, toolkit. Isn't it cool that uh, so much what what I'll just throw in one big basket and called s soil science that this stuff is becoming so much more available to all of us? You know, when when cannabis had to be you know, in the dark and in the prohibition days and even farther back when all we could find was, you know, a column or two in High Times magazines in the Stone Age, right? <clears throat> uh, nowadays, though, not only can we talk more publicly about soil cultivation and soil science as it relates to cannabis, but now, like, you know, you, you mentioned Elaine, you know, you can, you can take her classes, you can take her online classes. There's, uh, there's that great traveling science, um, uh, classes that Joshua Rutherford is running. Uh, what is that? Organic regenerative cannabis.com, I think, but he's, you know, he's taking these soil scientists and, you know, per, you know, taking them across the country. So people, you know, in Michigan and, and Maine can get the same kind of stuff too. It really is a game changer. I think from everybody from, you know, the high commercial level who certainly needs it, but really, you know, so many patient and just, you know, enthusiastic home growers are diving into the soil science, which always brings me back to the idea that, that really cannabis cultivation is a, um, you know, is an entryway to all sorts of horticulture. Yo, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I really love what Joshua was doing. I went to his first one last year in, um, in Portland and he's he's got such a great vision, and uh, I'm really proud to know him, and ha happy that he's doing that because you're right. This is uh, um, it's a very interesting time because you've, we have a lot of people. We touched on it earlier. A lot of people that are just kind of sick of the system as it is, as it's been presented, and are realizing that there's a, a safer way to produce your medicine or to produce your cannabis and and not have to sacrifice yields or 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 anything you, you actually it's a win win you're producing a safer higher quality medicine and it's and it's a better product <laughs> than you would otherwise and and in doing so 
I've seen lots of people go from cannabis and now they've got Hugo culture veggie beds and and they're they're taking this living soil uh, idea and and bringing it once again back to the old days like this is how we grew you know before commercial fertilizers so that, so it's people just really reclaiming our past and there's this kind of maybe this uh, inherent nostalgia that happens you know uh, when we when we participate in that yeah, I want to I want to go back and fix the the URL that I put out because I'm sure that that Joshua is out there listening to this going, you gave the wrong domain because <laughs> and, 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 I wasn't planning on mentioning it, so it wasn't in my notes. But but it's regenerativeorganiccannabis.com, and so uh, he's doing four or five of these that are that are going across the entire U.S. and he's bringing people like you know Kevin Jodry and Lang Ingham with him across the country. That's super cool. So uh, so let's go ahead and take our second commercial break. Uh, you are listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Joshua Steensland, lead cultivator at Freshwater Farms. Now that the health benefits of terpenes have become well known in the cannabis industry, people everywhere are looking for the purest terpenes without adulterants. The problem with most terpene providers is that they're not sourced naturally and instead are made as a byproduct of refining petroleum, and that's so sketchy. The terpenes sold by true terpenes are entirely different. They are certified organic, non-GMO, and food grade. That means that they are extracted from real plant sources. There are no solvents of any kind. They are distilled only with steam. That's right, only steam. In fact, terpenes from true terpenes are so pure that you can eat them. Not only that, but you can stack them with better results too. And what I mean is, other companies' terpenes have got a few percent of impurities, and when you stack those terpenes to make your blend, you're adding a variety of impurities that degrade your final product. True terpenes also have strain-specific terpenes for a wide range of cannabis strains like Durban Poison, Sunset Sherbet, and Granddaddy Purple. True terpenes has robust and supportive customer service, so your questions will get answered fast and efficiently. If you've shopped for terps before, you know how rare that is. So whether you want to cup your hands to smell some beta caryophylline to calm down after getting too high, or if you want to dab some pinene so your lungs feel fabulous and your mind feels liberated, True Terpenes will provide you with a truly natural experience. If you are a cannabis product developer, these are the terps you want to add to your oil or edible or capsule or whatever. True Terpenes are simply the best your money can buy. Don't try and make a premium product with substandard terps. Choose true terpenes for a top shelf experience. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash true terpenes to find out more or click on the link in this week's newsletter. As a business owner, you are incredibly busy. In reality, you are responsible for everything your company does. You've got so many responsibilities every single day that often you just don't have the time to really dig into your marketing as deeply as you'd like. You know there's more that you could do to reach out to new customers and encourage loyalty in the customers you do have, but you certainly don't have the time for it, and you're not really ready to hire someone full-time for that role either. For you, I recommend Blunt Branding. At Blunt Branding, Kirsten Nelson and her team are focused on improving your bottom line. You know, most marketing firms are excited to make your logo, packaging, and website very pretty, but they leave responsibility for improving your bottom line up to you. They don't want that kind of responsibility, but that's pretty much the most important part of marketing, right? Kirsten and her team will help you engage new customers, funnel them to your point of sale, whether it be online or a storefront, and keep them coming back to you and telling their friends. Now, if you happen to be a new cannabis company or an established company moving from medical to adult use in your state, Kirsten especially can help you. Not only is she well-versed in marketing and finance, but she totally gets cannabis, whole plant medicine, terpenes, heritage farmers, and the particular needs of startups. Check out what she did recently for Moontime Medicinals in Humboldt County at MoontimeMedicinals.com. Kirsten and her team put together a whole brand package for them, built their website, and wrote their sales materials. No doubt, this is a paid commercial spot, but that does not mean that they bought my opinion. I've worked with Blunt Branding on four projects now for various clients, and every single time they have done more than they've promised and over-delivered on results. I love how they generate new revenue and focus on that as the goal instead of just making you a pretty logo. Similarly, every single friend I've referred them to has come back to thank me. That just doesn't happen every day. 
grab a pen and paper because the website address is coming. If you want someone to implement marketing programs that feed your bottom line, give Blunt Branding a call. They will share proven techniques to increase your audience and generate sales while using cutting edge technology solutions in the background that make all of this easy, automatic, and trackable. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash blunt branding to find out more. You can also click on the link in our newsletter. Blunt branding, marketing that makes you money. Welcome back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. And our guest this week is Joshua Steensland, lead cultivator at Freshwater Farms. So Joshua, you know, in addition to all this groundbreaking polyculture stuff that you're doing, and the fact that you're doing it indoors is even more mind-blowing, you're also no-till, and no-till is becoming exceptionally popular. And so uh, would you just take a moment and uh, explain a little bit about how you're implementing no-till in your four-by-eight beds and what your planting and harvesting processes look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No-till has really become kind of a, a buzzword at, as of late over the past couple of years. Um, so when I think of no-till, I you know, I literally think of not tilling. So, you know, I, I try to, when I plant my, uh, my crop plants, my cannabis, I will p- put them in the ground in a small container as possible so if i can if i can take my cuttings in clone form as just rooted cubes or rooted cuttings i'll put those directly into my beds because i don't want to displace any of that soil that where we, we were talking earlier about the the fungal components and the bacterial components we, we don't want to disturb that delicate system like if we had one gallon pots and we had 24 or 18 plants in a 4 by 8 bed or even 12 in a 4 by 8 bed, you're displacing 12 gallons of medium that was in the beds, happy, doing its thing, and you're just tearing it up and displacing it. You know? and, and I think ultimately that's not – it's not the end of the world. Your your beds will recover, but I think over time there's this cumulative benefit that happens to really just allowing that soil structure to remain intact. You know, if you, if you haven't disturbed areas of the bed for over three years, you can imagine the the strength of that communication network that resides in there is going to be pretty vast. Yeah, it's like it's like oh, we've got all these mycelium super highways. Why on earth would we break that up and then start over every year when when we already have all that maturity in the soil? Exactly. Yeah. So so okay. So if if your optimum situation is just to create a little opening and put a bare rooted start in there, how do you go about um, amending your beds without uh, disturbing the soil? Sure. Yeah, I, I tend to just top dress, mm-hmm. and so um, when I amend, I I once again I tend to under amend. I know that it's, it's been recommended that you do about fourteen pounds of dry um, uh, nutrients and minerals per four by eight bed. I do about seven, um, and so I do half of what's been recommended from Tad at Kiss, and then we've been doing quite well with that. Once again. And I just top dress, top dress and maybe sprinkle it a little in. And then what happens is the cover crop will kind of grow over it and the, the soil life just kind of pulls it in. Oh, that's interesting. Good. Wow. Hmm. Well, that, that actually uh, go, speaks to my next question, which was, how do you actually do it? Because, all right, so uh, let's say that today you're, you harvest and you're going to start a new cycle in just a couple days, what a lot of people will do is, is top dress and then kind of flood it with water to, to cause the nutrients to soak in more. But then you've got a really wet bed, and so you need to let that even out a little bit. Um, but I, I like your idea that you are using uh, less top dress over a wider area, watering regular, and then <clears throat> the idea that the soil comes up and, and sucks it down, you know, it takes it itself. Hmm. Right. Yeah, that's that's kind of the, the, the visualization I have is like is that really just like the worms will make their way up to the surface. They'll they'll know that the kelp is there, the crab meal is there, they'll come up there, they'll start to consume it, 
the process of them making their way to the surface and then and then uh, heading back down again is going to pull some of that down. Um, and then just the natural, just the natural microbial activity is going to just break it down, and and you'll get like a kind of a precipitation. So let's so let's so we talked about the the beginning of the cycle for no till. Mm -hmm. Let's talk the end of the cycle of no till. So so what does your no till harvest look like? Sure, um, it's just like any anybody else. We I don't do I, I don't do a dry out or any kind of weird stressing. Um, I, I shouldn't say weird because people do it and they like it. It's just it, for a living soil bed, it, I don't like to stress temperature stress the plants because I don't want to affect the soil temperature. And obvious, for obvious reasons, I don't want to dry out or over, you know, over stress that, that soil microbiome. And so with no-till, it's literally just cutting the plant right at the soil level and then proceed with your dry and cure um, methods as normal and then after that is in my particular methodology in my minimalist kind of water only um thought process or our methodology is we just will re-amend at that time once we have no um cash crop in the bed at that time we've harvested then i'll do my re-amendment amendment if it's after the second cycle and then i'll let it sit for about a week before i transplant the clones in mm -hmm. Um, and that's just kind of to ease my mind. I don't feel like the nutrients that, uh, amendments that we use are necessarily hot or would, or would be a detriment. I just kind of like to give the soil time to uh, acclimate to its, its new influx of nutrients and minerals before putting the, plugging the plants in. Do you pull the root ball and plant in its place or do you plant beside the former root ball? We plant beside the former root ball. Once again, we don't want to disturb that kind of that 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 delicate infrastructure in there. And the the roots become worm food, and they also uh, leave air cavities in there for aeration and water to flow. It's just a, a, a really good thing to leave in your soil. I, I always I just drove by a hemp field recently, and they had fifteen or twenty people out there digging the root balls of their hemp crop out and I was, and piling it in a big pile and burning it. And I was just oh, like, no, wow. what are you doing? Not only are you wasting man hours and labor, you're wasting a valuable resource and you're depleting your soil. I was, they're just, it, it pains me. <laughs> yeah, and if, and if it was medical grade hemp instead of fiber hemp, there's actually really valuable medicinal properties in those root balls oh. as well. What a waste. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really a shame. Uh, unfortunately, there's just um, still a lot of funky cultivation practices going around. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So so I haven't done enough volume to have a, an informed opinion on this when, or, 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 or experience. When you plant next to the old root ball, will that root ball uh, break down and nutrient cycle back into the soil within one cycle or will it be there for a couple cycles now the, the the delicate parts of the root ball will go away pretty quick as you can imagine so like the finer roots and whatnot those tend to go really fast and i would say that those are gone from after the first cycle and and i've never done i've never sliced into my soil to look i mean it would be really interesting to kind of see but all i can judge is by what the the stem and stocky material that's above the soil line that I've left after clipping, it's, it sticks around and is visible for about six months. But if you went in and touched it, it would be spongy and you could break it apart really super easy. So my guess is that the stuff that's below the soil is long gone after your second cycle, after the second cycle post-harvest. It, it, the stuff that's above that has a access to air that it, it tends to stay around a little more but if you touched it or it was stepped on or anything like that it would just be nothing it would it would break apart to nothing right on right on so um <clears throat> in preparation for uh, for chatting with you um you know I, I spent a lot of time on your youtube channel which is really easy to do and one of the videos uh uh, uh 
informs this next question. You know, raw inputs like kelp and crab meal cannot be eaten directly by the plant. And so one of two things either has to happen. Either you have to purchase a pre-digested um, you know, uh, nutrient in a bottle, uh, or you have to introduce the whole kelp or crab meal or whatever, and give the microbes time to digest it, which will then be picked up by the cannabis plant. Um, what are your views on this? Which do you prefer and why? Well, I, I mean, I, I clearly prefer the the kind of the amending. I don't like the plant-ready, soluble, bottled nutrients um, simply because you're not allowing the plant to regulate its own uptake at that point. So when you have a when you have a, a soluble, plant-ready nutrient, it the plant's just going to take it up because it's it's designed to be absorbed readily by the plant. And and it typically my my very rudimentary understanding is that is that the root exudates play less of a part when you're dealing with those kind of water soluble uh, synthetics or even like a water soluble organic nutrient that's just plant ready um, this this came up because people there there was a question in the community of whether uh, no-till pl- beds need to be flushed mm-hmm. and so so this came about it, it basically from that there's a, there's a, a, a group of folks who think that all plants need to be flushed and that because if you check the runoff of a no-till bed, it's got three or 400 parts per million and that, 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 that means that it's, you know, your plants aren't flushed properly. And, and, and I think that that's where that kind of video came from was me kind of addressing that aspect that, you know, a, a a raw kelp is a lot is a lot different in the soil than a, a water soluble plant ready nutrient, and so I definitely am on the side of the fence that raw uh, nutrients and minerals that you uh, you allow the soil biology to process and have their exchange with the plant, you're gonna you're gonna get a, a your maximum genetic expression, your maximum terpene expression, um, and that's just based. Based on my experience, I cultivated for 15, 16 years um, with synthetic nutrients and organic bottled nutrients and plant-ready nutrients. And the second I switched to living soil, there was a marked improvement. The quality of the product was outrageously good, and and, and I was never turning back. It makes a really good case, too, for not swapping out your soil every cycle, too, right? I mean, oh, my yeah. gosh. You know, uh, you know, in, in the older days, it was like, oh, we want fresh soil. Right. And, and, and nowadays, that seems so foolhardy because we spend all this time and effort building this rhizosphere and all these healthy micros and the mycelium and everything. And, and then you throw it out and you're like, ah, you know. But nowadays, you, you, you know, with living soil, you – not only are giving your microbes, say for example, kelp, but they may not process it all during this cycle. And so you might get some advantages from that kelp next cycle because you, you've you kept the same soil. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the, other, that's the other benefit of this kind of, this process is that you're allowing the plant. And, and in one of my YouTube videos, the no-till, talks series that I kind of did, which was uh, uh, based on a lot of people just asking me to explain my minimalist kind of water-only approach. And so I like to think of that interaction between the soil and plant as this sacred union. And so when the plant is interacting with a healthy microbiome in the soil, it's asking it's calling for only the stuff that it needs and nothing more. And that's, that goes back to that why we don't have to flush is because it's not overfeeding itself. The plant doesn't have a capacity to overfeed itself. It's a, it's a highly finely tuned mechanism in itself that allows it to, to only ask for what it needs and only receive that. So there's never like an, an over – it doesn't overfeed itself nitrogen ever. So when you allow that natural – kind of process that was designed in the plant that it evolved in the plant and you're not bypassing that i think that's the one of the contributing factors to getting plants that so clearly 
are exhibiting maximum genetic expression. You know, their their genetic potential is fully expressed because you're allowing those little those little micro mechanisms in the plant to play itself out. I mean, they're, they're there for a reason. When you put it elegantly like that, it really points out how, you know, the soil has an intelligence and a heart and, uh, and a strategy for itself. And, uh, and, and, and mostly so long as we can set up the soil to succeed, it will do its work. Absolutely. Yeah. So kind of changing gears a little bit, um, uh, I've seen from the fantastic Freshwater Farms Instagram, which unfortunately was deactivated, but but we've got a new one we'll give you the address for in a little bit. But Freshwater Farms uses LED lights. How, what's your experience been using LED? Oh, boy. I, I'll tell you what. It, I was a really hard sell. Um, I've been an HID cultivator from the beginning, so over 20 years. And... Um, I just had never had any personal experience. I hadn't seen any flowers grown with LED. And having been a former owner of two brick and mortar kind of indoor grow shops, I am intimately aware of the vast quantity of snake oil that permeates the industry and this kind of no R&D products that hit the market where the consumers end up becoming the research and development. Yeah. So I was, I was really, really weary of stepping into this realm and looking towards other large scale cultivators that just simply never that, that haven't even to this to this date haven't made the transition because they're skeptical and weary of the technology and that whether it had arrived or not. So I was extremely extremely trepidatious moving forward. I had I lo- looked to Grow Mouse. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's kind of a really popular DIY led guy who's working with chilled led uh, now and he's I, I really value his value his opinion and so i reached out to him when i connected with mike at freshwater farms um you know when he was like we, we were discussing how we wanted to go about setting up this facility and um long story short he put me in contact with uh, the current light company that we use now lighting company for led and it took about six months of talks and visiting um, places that were using them and, and just getting assurances from folks that I knew were using similar technology and getting the results they were getting. You know, it, it was enough for me to move forward and try it out. So that being said, we're, we're really impressed with uh, LED tech. I think it's arrived. You know, We're getting to the point where we have lights where you have independent spectral tuning abilities. You're allowed to tune your reds, your yellows, and your blue whites independently. So you can actually affect the, how your plant grows, the nodal spacing, the uh, lateral growth, all those type of things. So there's a, there's a bit of a learning curve for folks like me who's just used to hanging an HID really high and letting it fly. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's... There was a bit of a learning curve on my part, but I really think that um, you know the the uh, the the chance for LEDs to kind of overtake the HID um, lights in the industry. It, it's not if it's when it, it's happening. Like we're we're seeing we're seeing yields, you know, that are you know three pounds, two and a half to three pounds per seven hundred watts of led fixture you know which is pr- which is pretty impressive and and then it's we're not sacrificing terpenes we're not sacrificing any of those things so i think i think as as we refine our abilities with the lights we'll, we'll start to um there'll, there'll start to be a greater appreciation of what the leds can do there's got to be some people out there who are begging to, that you name drop uh, the the kind of light that you decided to use. So do you do you want to plug your lighting folks? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, we we're going with the ProGrowTech EV seven hundreds. Um, they're uh, a really great company, and the light that they have, the fixture that they have, and all of our research. We went around, and I'm not going to name the ones that we didn't like. Um, but we saw and talked to many, many LED lighting manufacturers, and they all seemed so cheap, and they seemed so flimsy. And this this unit from ProGrowTech is really 
durable, sturdy. It's completely waterproof. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of benefits to this fixture. So I highly recommend people check them out. All right, fantastic. Mm-hmm. So you know, before we wrap up, Joshua, I want to I want to give you a nice big open question, uh, kind of a fishing expedition. You know, um, I have folks with a depth of experience <clears throat> like you on the show, and and sometimes you know I, I can put together a, a, a question path like I like did for today. But but I'm really curious, what what did I not ask you? What 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 do you know that you are excited about that people in the scene just aren't talking about yet? And I'm not experienced enough to ask you. So so I just want to like, you know, open it up for you and say, what are you excited about that we should know about that you want to break down for us? Sure, sure. Well, I think that I don't think there's anything really that you haven't touched on, but I I do think that um, what I am personally have been excited about over the past six months or so is uh, diving into biodynamic cultivation practices. Um, And and in looking into that, it's almost like thinking of your so- uh, thinking of handling your soils in a homeopathic fashion. So really very, think very small, powerful, kind of, it sounds starry-eyed again. It, it's kind of like you're dealing with energy almost more. Like So there's things like the horn manure and horn silica where they, they, they take manure and cow manure and pack it into a uh, cow's horn. And it's specifically a cow's horn. They've tried to use other horns like goat and and ibex, and it just doesn't have the same effect. They'll bury it for the winter, and then what happens is this transmutation takes place, and you're left in the springtime when you dig these things up, you're left with this ball of rubbery, humic material that's pleasant to smell, doesn't smell like manure, It's and it's a highly valuable resource for your soil, for your soil microbiology, and you can use super small quantities of this to revi- revitalize a very large amount of area. And and so the, there's this horn manure, there's horn silica, where they'll take quartz crystal, grind it up, put it into the hor- uh, cow horn, bury it in the summertime, and then dig it out and then use it as a foliar application to help maximize, like if you have a in a cloudy day and you don't have don't have very much light, it'll help maximize the light that you do have. And there's a lot of really good research uh, validating a lot of these things. And that's just a couple of the inputs, the biodynamic inputs. There's a lot of them. And some of them are pretty strange when you get down into it. But the science behind it is really, really interesting. And there's a lot of people like uh, wine producers that are switching to this biodynamic cultivation because they've noticed the difference in their in their grapes uh, that they're more wild tasting and and the the f- more rich and the flavor profile is is very high. So I would like to kind of take this into the cannabis realm. You know uh, when you know, the, the first part putting the compost in the horn and burying it. I'm like, all right. That sounds different and unique, but but I can see how there could be some subtle science that we haven't learned yet there. But then your second example, you're all like, you know, grinding crystals. And I could almost <laughs> hear like everybody in the audience kind of together roll our eyes. Yep. But at the same time, you know, um, uh, I'm not so uh, cocky or full of myself that I think that I know all the ways that the world works, right? And so if if, if people are getting, um, you know, qualitative, if not quantitative, positive results, and lots of science supports the energetics of crystals, well, all right, there's, there's a whole lot of things that science hasn't unearthed yet, and maybe there's something to that. But but holy smokes, right? <laughs> yeah, yo, yo, tell me about it. I, I was hesitant to talk about it be, for that very reason, because it, it immediately puts you in this class of like starry-eyed hippie, just kind of like, you know, well, that guy's really like, you know, he's on one or something. But it, it, when you look into it, Steiner, the guy who developed this um, – was was no was no hack. He really was a really intelligent man and he was very gifted. And when you start looking into uh, some of this biodynamic stuff, 
and you can get past that kind of weird feeling. This is like we were talking about earlier with the soil. Like what what looks like magic to us, there's science behind it. We just haven't found it yet. And so I think that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about biodynamics. Now, I'm no expert. I'm just now starting to kind of wet my whistle in that regard, but it's wildly and insanely fascinating to me. And you're clearly a soil adventurer, right? Sure. You know, so so this is this is novel and kind of weird and potentially works. That sounds like a recipe that like will totally attract you personally Absolutely. as a cultivator. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, the only thing that I had ever heard about biodynamic really up till today, I mean, I, I see biodynamic on bottles of wine, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But but you know, you'll get people arguing back and forth on forums like the Probiotic Farmers Alliance on Facebook, and 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 people will talk about either popping their seeds or harvesting with different moon cycles and stuff mm. like that. And and I don't I don't personally have an opinion one way or another because I don't know enough to have an informed opinion. But is that part of your bigger picture with attraction to bi biodynamics? Are you are you popping seeds with the moon? Not not just yet. <laughs> I haven't drank the Kool Aid that much yet. Uh -huh. I mean, I think I think that uh, look, the moon clearly has an effect on bodies of water on the planet, and it, and so the when you think about how it affects the tides, you know, and you think that we are a, a very large percentage water, the plants have a large percentage of water in them. It, it, it would stand to reason that if the moon is affecting large bodies of water, in, like the ocean with tides, that there's some kind of effect on anything that ha that is water based on, on this globe. So, you know, I can get with it. I can, I can, I can see where they're going with it. I just haven't gone that far down the rabbit hole. I think you can incorporate some of the biodynamic principles without having to go that far into it in planting and harvesting according to, um, you know, astrological signs and whatnot. But once again, who are we to kind of say that there's nothing there? You know, we just, we simply just don't know. We, we, we can just shrug our shoulders and be like, ah, that sounds crazy. But until we actually practically apply it, if there's, we, we can't really formulate that opinion. What we do know is that there's lots of people who do utilize this. Lots of commercial farms operate under these biodynamic principles and they crush it. Their, their, their vegetables and fruits are routinely more nutrient and mineral dense than conventional, even organic practices. So there's something, there's some, something that that's there that deserves a, a closer look right on that's awesome i'm so glad that you were willing to go there with me joshua <laughs> that was that was a really interesting section so so before we sign off uh i want to give you props because uh it just came out this week um that we're recording this the 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 week before emerald cup and uh and one of your photographs was while it did not win it, you got information that you were a finalist right well, I placed in the top 30, so it, it, it's really kind of a funny thing. I saw that they were doing the photo contest, and I was like, oh, man, I'll just, I'll just throw something in and see it. So I really didn't give it much thought. I just picked a photo that I really thought was, was great and sent it in with no expectation of any acknowledgement whatsoever. And they got back and said that I was in the top 30 out of a couple hundred entries. So you know, I was, uh, I was impressed. I felt, I felt humbled. Yeah, right. On. Well, hey, it's it's nice to get those kind of unexpected kudos, man. So yeah, so absolutely. so congratulations on Thank that. You. So so Joshua, thanks so much for being on the show. Um, not only do you have a wealth of experience, but you're just totally a delightful dude. So so thanks oh, yeah. for coming on, and and I look forward to talking with you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Right Pleasure. on. So, so if any of you want to uh, get in contact with Joshua or just follow along his totally awesome Instagram, uh, you can get that at Joshua Steensland, all one word. And Joshua is pretty easy, but Steensland is S T E E N S L A N D. Joshua Steensland, all one word. And then also, even though uh, his farms. Um, uh, his farm's IG got removed. They are reset up, but there there is only like fifteen or twenty photos there somewhere so far. But you're gonna want to follow that anyway. And that's Freshwater Farms 
and then two underscores. So Freshwater Farms and then with two underscores. And uh, and you don't want to miss that. And then finally, uh, you definitely want to subscribe to Joshua's uh, fabulous YouTube channel um, where uh, he records a lot of live stuff. He answers questions. He, he does how-tos in his garden at home. Uh, and that's fabulous. And, and for that, you just want to uh, search Joshua Steensland on YouTube. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I'll be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los.